All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Lai, if you don't know me already, um, from CPP Hyperloop. Uh, and this is a, a conjunction effort between IEEE and Robotics Club to bring you a series of workshops that cover the basics, basics of electronics. Today, we'll be covering the Arduino Lab. So different types of Arduino boards, different controllers, how you can use them in your everyday lives. And then we'll do some um, demonstrations, or I'll do some demonstrations for you, so that you can know that um, how they'll work you know, if you try building some in your projects yourself. And so um, because we're doing this virtually and it's not in person, a lot of this is just going to be conceptual. Um, and I hope some informative um, concepts you can take back from this workshop uh, and use it in your own projects as well, because we're going to go over a, a lot of different boards today. Um, I know you, you guys probably heard of just the regular Arduino, but you know, there's like a different types like Arduino, Unos, Nanos, Megas, there's Leos, there's, um, there's a lot of them. There's minis, there's micros, there's, and we're, we're not even just gonna cover Arduinos today, we're also gonna cover um, our ESPs, um, the circuit boards that are able to connect to the internet. I will also cover the uh, Leo in great detail, or the different types of chips that are on the microcontrollers, um, and also, a little bit on the Raspberry Pi, which we'll um, expand upon next week. All right, so I think I went on the intro a little bit too long, but this is the Arduino Lab, so welcome everyone, um, and let's get started. So today's agenda, um, usually uh, between 2 and 2.05, people are just trickling in. It's completely fine. Um, we're going to go over different types of controllers, as I talked about. Um, including the Arduino family, the Leo and USB support for the U4 chips, the ESP32 and ESP8266, and a little bit on the Raspberry Pi, but not too much in detail. For the demo, we're just going to go over um, the basic, the most basic Arduino script you can ever think of, which is pretty much Blink, um, turning an LED on and off on our Arduino board. Uh, we're gonna go over the GPIO, which stands for General Purpose Input Output Pins, uh, we're not going to go into like PWM or analog today, just the basics. Uh, we are going to plan some more workshops next semester where we go more in depth in Arduino because a lot of workshops this year have just been on software like Python and those basic skills. Um, we're also going to go into um, setup, serial, and pin mode uh, and what goes in the setup block and also what goes in the loops. So we're going to go over um, just the basics of how you can create an Arduino script. And then I'll go ahead and demonstrate the Alexa Sync project. The timestamp there is weird. Don't mind it. It's going to be around like 12, 2.45. And it's just something fun I, um, I, I've made using an Arduino board. And I still use it to this day. I think it's like a year old now. It's still like running strong. Uh, shows no signs of stopping. So I think it's really cool to show. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to interject at any time. Um, I do the workshops for you guys. And we hope that our... Hyperloop, IEEE, and Robotics, I'll speak for them. They all hope that you guys can bring something back from this. Let's get started. So let's start talking about microcontrollers. A common misconception about microcontrollers is that an Arduino is a microcontroller. And that is not entirely untrue. So while an Arduino is kind of like a microcontroller, the microcontroller is the chip that's on top of the Arduino that does all of the math and all of the functions and all the calculations. So these will be like um, our 18 mega 328P, this like large IC here, integrated circuit, or even a smaller one like the 18 mega 32U4, which is like a smaller SMD chip. SMD uh, is like the surface mount stuff. This is my way the point it works. Awesome. So microcontrollers come in all different shapes and sizes, but the Arduino itself is not a microcontroller. Um, Arduino is like a chassis for the microcontroller and it allows you to access the microcontroller from, um, from the GPIO pins easier because you don't want to go ahead and solder the GPIO pins directly onto the legs of the IC, right? That'd be incredibly inconvenient. Um, this IC is more like the old style, um, the 328Ps. If you look at Arduino Unos, they have like a very big chip in the middle, and that's like an EEPROM, um, erasable, erasable memory. Um, but these chips are pretty old. The newer ones, like the 32U4, we'll cover why this is special later. But these are really um, 
these are really small compared to this. Even like the, the picture scale isn't really like representative of the IC itself, but the 32U4 has evolved. It's a newer version of the old 328P. And some UNOs actually have evolved from like this long shape model into like a square SMD as well. Um, and this is because um, of something called Moore's law. So Moore's law is the theory that every two years or so, uh, the number of transistors on a chip will double. And then the size of the chip will also shrink by half. And this is evident here, right? If you guys aren't, aren't already like convinced about our like the development of computers over time and how they have been advancing, well, here's a more um, low level explanation for you, I guess a uh, visual for you in that these Arduino boards have gone from this big long chip to a small square one in a couple of years. So our basic Arduino microcontrollers, like the AT Mega 328P is used on the Arduino Uno, as well as the Mega and some other boards. Um, this is a dual inline purpose chip, like a DAP chip, or sometimes people also call it an IC or an integrated circuit. It is pretty old, like explained, but it's good for DIY. Um, let me go ahead and quickly share this PowerPoint with you guys. I'm gonna click share. Uh, just anyone will think. And if you, go, if you guys would like to go on this um, PowerPoint here, the viewer comments actually do have a lot of good links. Uh, if you would like to purchase some of these items, they're not affiliate links. I'm not that greedy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, these do have good links in case you want to actually take a look at them. They may be references. They may be Amazon links I just pushed onto there. Um, but they give you more information about the item overall. And for this one, um, if you ever want to build your own Arduino just for fun, you know, uh, <laughs> the, they do sell the DIP chips individually and they are pretty cheap. Pretty cheap is a kind of overstatement. Amazon is probably not the best place to buy them. You can probably find them on like Alibaba or eBay for like a couple cents. But these long chips are um, probably the most expensive ones out there. Uh, if you've been in 2300 ECE 2300 with uh, digital logic, you kind of worked with uh, these like AND gates or gates like the 74 LS series. And it's kind of like it, kind of looks like it, right? But um, inside this little chip, there's a computer. So if you ever want to build your own Arduino, which you can, by the way, Arduinos are open sourced. And that's why there's so much, no so many knockoffs out there. We'll talk about knockoffs later, but um, yeah, you can build your own Arduino. You just need like a uh, crystal oscillator. Uh, you need a voltage regulator. You need a way to access all the pins. And then you can totally do it with like this big chip. With a smaller chip, that's kind of <laughs> questionable because that's a lot of small pins you got to solder on. Um, but it's a good DIY project. Mm -hmm. And then the viewer uh, viewer notes do have the link to that on, on Amazon. You that's the word I was thinking of. So the AT Mega Thirty Two U Four is a newer model of the chip that actually comes with USB Two Point support. This is important because, well, let's say uh, one of my re most recent projects was building like a game controller in which I can control something on my computer with the Arduino. And that's kind of like USB 2.0 because it transmits data across the USB into my computer in which my computer can then use that data to, um, to activate commands like a key press or a mouse press or a scroll up or a scroll down. So if you guys have one of those masses that you can program to it to be a macro, it's kind of like it. It's kind of like putting a macro on um, like an Arduino creation of your own. So these AT Mega 32 U4s are upgraded. Uh, they are pretty nice. They're also pretty expensive. The three boards I found that do have the support are the Arduino Uno, Arduino Leo, and Arduino Micro. Yun and Micro are not talked about, but like Leo is being hyped up around this time because it's the newer, it's the newer Uno. That's what everyone's calling it. It's faster, it's better, it's more processing power. It's just general overall. These are usually SMD components, so they're surface mounts, they're newer technology, and they come with USB 2.0 support. I'm gonna stress this a lot because um, you want to pinpoint specific differences between these boards, because there's gonna be a lot of them, uh, but they are all used for something, they have like pros and cons to each of them. So like depending on your project, you wanna choose wisely. We'll move on to the next slide here, where we talk about the Arduino Nano, Uno, and Mega, or just like the basics of um, the Arduino board itself. This is, this is the thing you've probably heard many, many times before. 
But there are a ton of boards. If you click on this link, um, it'll take you to the Wikipedia page of single board microcontrollers. And this is like the official name of them. They have a microcontroller on them, but they're not known as microcontrollers. They're like tools to access the microcontroller, you know? So whenever you start a project, let's say you wanna build a robot that can get you a drink, you know, and you wanna use an Arduino for it. You have to decide on which board to use. Now, I put the title in order from like lowest processing power to highest processing power and like lowest GPIO pins to highest GPIO pins. Nano is very small and I can show you an example. I have one plugged into my computer here ready for demonstration, but this is what a Nano looks like. If you know what a breadboard looks like, um, this is a 400 breadboard, but the Nano is pretty tiny. The Uno is about the size of the breadboard itself and the Mega is like twice the size of the breadboard. Um, and the main differences between these three is pretty much just processing power and pin count. They all use the same chip, the ATmega 328P. And so the size is a big deal because let's say you want to build something very small, like a temperature sensor for your backyard garden. Uh, you don't, you want to minimize the amount of space, like the amount of real estate your board takes, because that's pretty important. You don't want it to be too big. So you want to choose a nano instead of a mega. However, if your temperature uh, sensor outside needs a lot of processing power, which it usually doesn't, by the way, but if it does, then you would need to go ahead and use maybe a Uno or, I don't know, if you want to use a mega for like heavy duty operations, you can. Heavy duty operations are usually reser reserved for like robotics. Like um, maybe you want to build a robotic hand um, that makes your own hand movement and it has a lot of things going in and out. That's probably a good use for mega. But um, these are kind of basic <laughs> these days. But they're good uh, for beginners. And on the bottom right here, we can see uh, we have a diagram of a Arduino here um, and different parts of it. As we said, we have the digital pins and we have the analog pins. Um, now, digital pins can receive, uh, still showing the presentation. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, I, did, I didn't change screen. I, just, I was just uh, showing the presentation here. <laughs> I wasn't planning on it. But if you want to click the link, you can. Um, and so the analog pins are pins that can receive and output um, data that's not a zero or a one. It can go from like zero to 1024 or zero to 256, whatever you limit it as. And there is actually a function in Arduino called mapping in which you can map a set of numbers to another set of numbers, um, but that's a little more difficult. and usually use that for speed control. Um, in case you want to limit your motor to a specific speed, uh, specific pulse width modulation, uh, you would use that. Analog pins, an interesting application of them, which you've probably never heard of, but maybe you have. Um, the analog pins can be used to sense EMF signals, um, which means if you take a bare wire and you stick it in an Arduino analog pin and you just wave it around, if there is voltage, let's say you wave your on a wall socket, that is voltage, right? Uh, the Arduino can be able to pick it up because the socket emits EMF signals. It's pretty cool. Uh, people actually use Arduinos to build like hidden camera detectors um, because the hidden cameras emit EMF signals and the Arduino picks it up using the analog pin. So when we do like voltage sensors or voltage dividers in like Hyperloop where we have to uh, regulate the voltage coming out from the battery, uh, we will use the analog pin because it's very good for sensing those signals. Digital pins are just zero and ones, GPIO, general pin, input, output. We also have PWM pins, as we can see here. Um, on the right, we have the UART pins, which are the transmission receiving, TX is transmitting, RX is receiving. And also we have, uh, we have different types of communication, which is um, more complicated, but maybe some of you guys know something about it, um, which are the SPI communication. We have I2C communication, UART is type of communication with the Arduino, and then we have serial communication. Uh, we may go over these next semester, but these are really good in case you want to use sensors that support these types of communication with the Arduino. So anyways, the pins 9 to 13 are um, the SPI communications. Uh, SPI requires four pins, ITC requires two pins, uh, UART requires the ones and zero pins, and serial requires the USB connector. Um, more parts. We have the reset switch, 
Some of the Arduinos do not come with the reset switch. Um, those are mainly knockoffs, so watch out for that. You may have to build your own reset switch if you don't have one. It's really important because sometimes your Arduino code goes out of sync and you just hit that thing to give it a restart. Uh, you have a USB connector and a USB interface chip. It's important because you need some way to flash the EEPROM that's on your Arduino. Uh, so you can flash the microcontroller with its new memory and that is memory is used to program the board. You have a crystal oscillator. I love these things um, because A, they look cool. B, they are very powerful. It's pretty much a clock. Um, a clock that, in most Arduinos, I think it's like 16 megahertz, but it oscillates. And based on those oscillations, you'll be able to, well, there's not, there are oscillations, they're like square wave oscillations. You can control um, how many of those to take and how many of those to leave behind. And that's pretty much the basis of um, if you want to control signal inside your Arduino. You have the TXRX LEDs. Those are pretty important. Um, TXRX will actually tell you if there's something printing out to a serial monitor. And we'll cover that later. But if you're printing something out to the serial monitor and you need to know uh, at what speed it printed out, um, it, the either the TX or RX pin, I forget which one, will flicker based on the frequency that you print stuff out to the terminal window. So in Python, we cover terminal window, right? We hit play on the script and then stuff starts coming out in the terminal window. We can see it. In the Arduino, the terminal window exists as what's called a serial monitor uh, because there's no terminal window. When we upload the code to the Arduino, the Arduino will spit data back to us in terms of serial data. And our computer recognizes the serial data and prints it out to us on a monitor. However, the, the, the let's say the troubleshooting print lines are coming all from the Arduino itself. All right, I've, I've ranted on too long about the top half of the board. Now for the bottom half. This voltage regulator is really important. Sometimes if you accidentally burnt out the voltage regulator by putting too many, um, too many volts inside the VN pin, this thing will start to heat up, start to smoke, and it'll start to burn out. This thing protects you from any um, overvolting, undervolting, short circuits uh, that may happen to you um, on your journey to learning Arduino. So let's make sure this thing is OK at all times. And finally, the power port, pretty simple. Uh, if you want to put in external power from like a uh, wall socket, you just plug it into here. This is also another source for power in case you want the, um, it's like the, it's not like two wires, it's like the long cylinder um, that you plug into the power port. All right. Uh, so again, decide on the following before choosing a board. You want the size, processing speed, processing power, and the utility. And these Arduinos can be versatile. They can be used for robotics, fast computation, detection mechanisms, and controllers. Uh, controllers are pretty obvious, but detection mechanisms are like any sensor you want to put inside the Arduino. Maybe you want a home alarm. Um, you can have that, maybe like a sensor that can detect distance. And if someone walks through a door, the Arduino will send that output straight to like a speaker and scare them away with like a loud, loud beep. So completely possible with the Arduino. OK. Moving on to the Arduino Leo, Yoon, and Micro. So these are the ones with the fancy um, U4 chips. U4 chips are cool because they have built-in USB 2 communications, right? You can do things like make an Xbox controller out of buttons and limit switches that you put on under Arduino. And then you can play games using that controller because of the USB 2.0 connection. I would say though, these boards are more expensive um, just because they're newer and there's a chip shortage in the world right now, which we'll also cover later, but <laughs> it's uh, interesting how the prices have risen, especially for Raspberry Pis uh, because of the chip shortage. But you can do mouse control, keyboard control, and analog detection using the Leo. Now on the right side is a reference uh, of the comparison between Arduino Leo and Arduino Uno. Uh, you can just skim through that and clearly see that there's more options of the Leo than the Uno. Um, the same amount of memory, 32 kilobytes, but more output pins, more PWM pins, and more analog pins. So good things all around in case you want big projects. And again, if you want to see what a purchase of this thing looks like, you can go in the description. I trust Key Studio sometimes. Um, I would say it's usually trustworthy. 
you when you buy knockoffs, especially um, from like different vendors, you have to be careful about who they are. And Key Studio is fine, but you just got to read the documentation because they provide documentation on like a separate website, but they don't link it to you. You can easily Google that though. Um, the big boards are around $15. The small boards are around $12. They're pre still pretty expensive compared, compared to some other things. So um, this is just an option in case you want to have USB support. All right, now to go on to the ESP32 and ESP8266. So what if, you, what if you want an internet connection? What if you want to connect your board to the internet? Well, you use one of these things. Now, these aren't Arduinos necessarily, but they're it's like the same kind of deal, same kind of um, microprocessor on a board that is connected to different pinouts. Um, so these support um, both the Arduino IDE and MicroPython software. MicroPython is a little bit interesting. Um, you have to access it through PowerShell uh, and, and in like an Anaconda environment. I've done it like once and I don't want to do it ever again. But um, you can upload Python scripts onto this. They're not exactly Python scripts. They're like MicroPython, which is some different syntax you have to look up yourself. Um, but in case you want to write it in Python, it also accepts it. But Arduino IDE would be the most um, easiest way to upload stuff under these things. But again, they can connect to the internet. So you have to use the correct libraries. It does contain GPIO pins and ADC pins, which are analog to digital converters. Um, you can, oh, interesting thing about these, right? I said previously that on the Arduino, the SPI and I2C pins are kind of set, right? SPI are pins like 9 to 13. I2C are like the A4 and A5, which are SDA and SCL. Um, you can set this on the ESP32 because of its built-in multiplexer which means that pins are pretty much flexible to be whatever they want. Um, if you look at a pinout of ESP32, you can see that there is a lot of options and that option is great, but like you have to know how to access it through your script. And that's a story for another day. Um, these things have Bluetooth 4.2 and Bluetooth low energy or BLE built in. So uh, uh, in addition to internet, these also can connect to your Bluetooth devices. Um, which would be useful um, for maybe like home surveillance. Home surveillance. Home surveillance is a good thing. Um, I've heard of some people using ESP32s as kind of like a local server uh, in order to get all their CCTV from around their house into like a one position. And then you can also do this with like a Raspberry Pi, but we're, we're getting there. These are like increasing complexity from the Arduino. These things also have a built-in temperature sensor. Well, the ESP32 does. I don't think the ESP8266 does, but it's 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 a lot in like that one little chip. As I said, these are getting newer and newer. ESP ESP8266 has uh, I can't speak. ESP8266s have been here for a long time, but ESP32 is like its big brother, or like it's I guess no, I guess it'd be its younger brother. It's it's pretty new, so that's why it has all these features. Um, surprisingly. The ESP32 is cheaper than the Leo right now. ESP32 gets up for $9, and you can look at the link in the description, um, I mean, the viewer notes, for the links to get an ESP32, ESP which is the one I actually have. It's actually $9, and the ESP8266 is $5. So these are cheaper than the Leo, mainly because they've, I think these are newer, uh, the ESP32s. But they have... Um, I guess the 8266s are low, lower capabilities than the uh, Leo, and that's why it's cheaper. But yeah, um, I like talking, talking about prices because prices are important when you're buying stuff. I buy a lot of stuff from Amazon, um, more than I like to admit. But it's good to collect these because you never know when you need like an extra controller board for some project or some other thing. Applications. So I'm going to demonstrate the Alexa sync for you all later today, um, but you can collect, connect this to Alexa or your Google Home or Siri or whatever BLE device you have in your home. It's able to talk to them. Oh, oh, my, my Alexa just uh, <laughs> woke up. Probably not the best to talk about it while I'm <laughs> talking to you guys. Um, but your ESP32 is not limited to just BLE devices. It can also connect to the internet, which means you can send data packets to your um, local servers or external websites. 
And that's really cool. But just watch out for like firewall protection and firewall settings because those can uh, be a little fishy. I stick to local servers though, for these at least. And finally, Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is just the Wikipedia page. I linked the Wikipedia page in the description. Um, the reason I didn't put a buy link for these is because I personally do not know a good way to buy Raspberry Pis as of 2021 November because they're like very high in demand. Like the Raspberry Pi 02W, this thing came out like two weeks ago, I would say. I was there on the first day it was released. Um, I went on like Adafruit. It was all sold out. I went on SparkFun. It was all sold out. I went on this weird Russian website. It was all sold out there. These chips are very high in demand. It's really hard to get some these days without go buying like the Canakit um, Raspberry Pis. And those are pretty expensive. If you're looking for something cheap, I would suggest Micro Center. Um, they do sell Raspberry Pi Zeros for the zero Ws. The zero W and WHs can connect to the internet. So these are ultra compact, which are really nice. They're really small, pretty much small computers. And I remember like it was like almost yesterday where Raspberry Pi Bs and As were still a thing, but they have been discontinued. Uh, now it's all about the Raspberry Pi 3s and the 4s. Um, we usually use Raspberry Pi 4 Bs and projects now because they do have a lot of memory and random access memory. Uh, it has eight gigabytes, which is like a lot for like a small device. It's like this big almost. Um, and so it's a really good controller, but it's really high in demand and it requires a lot of technical skill to use, more technical skill than the other devices, which is why next week we're gonna go over how to set up Raspberry Pi headlessly um, without having to use a keyboard or like a USB mouse or like another monitor <laughs> because like a lot of um, introduction to Raspberry Pi tutorials tell you to use that. And there's a way around it. Um, it's not usually said on the internet, but there's a way around it. And uh, I've kind of figured it out with Hyperloop and I taught all the members or some of them. So next week we'll go over how to do that because I have a Raspberry Pi I need to set up with my internet. And there are a few tricks and tips on how to get around the um, complexity of everything. But yeah, Raspberry Pi. So at this point, does anyone have any questions? about anything I just talked about. All right, no questions? All right. We're gonna talk about knockoff boards because I think this is pretty fun. Um, this also has to do with the chip shortage and this is just something that's happening in the world right now. So buying knockoffs. I do recommend buying knockoffs. It'll save you money. However, you have to know which knockoffs to buy and which ones to stay away from. Because some may look cheap, but they don't work. Some may look cheap, they don't work, but you can fix them. And you have to have the skills to do so. The pros of buying knockoffs is that they're inexpensive, which is the biggest one, right? You want cheap boards. These ones um, on the right here, they're like four bucks for an Arduino Nano, which is um, kind of good, kind of bad. but they are reliable. Like I can tell you that I've bought like 15 of these already for different projects and they've all worked 100% effective rate. However, sometimes they won't show up on newer computers. Like if you plug your Arduino in, it won't show up as a port because your computer thinks it's like an external device and it doesn't recognize the serial bus on the USB. You have to install a separate driver for it and usually they'll fix it. Um, but Sometimes it's just broken. So you have to know which is which. They're relatively easy to acquire. They're all over Amazon. They're all over eBay, all over the website, uh, all over the internet. And they're a simple replacement. So if you break one, like if you accidentally fry Arduino Nano, which I've done multiple times, that can be done by like just having too much current pass through like the regulator or too high of a voltage. You can replace them really easily. However, the cons is that they may not always have the right bootloader. So you have to like search for that. It can be soldered on badly or soldered on badly. So like the connections, um, you guys see the, the pin headers here, they're soldered on. 
And some of the cheap ones, they don't use like the automatic soldering machines. They have like people in China actually solder them together. So those people may not actually know how to solder and they do it that may do it badly. So may have to go home and like do a little touch up work yourself. Uh, also, the USB ports are a big deal because sometimes um, these are like the chunky ones, right? These are the USB um, USB Type B. Uh, but if you have USB Mini on some of the other boards, they tend to fall very easily because again, the soldering job is pretty bad, and B the connection itself is just like not stable. They use the cheapest material possible, right, to make these things. So they can get a profit and you can buy their stuff for a cheap price. And I, re I can recommend doing this um, because the real boards are real expensive. And Arduino is like 20 something dollars. And if you're like burning through five of those for a project and you're paying it out of your own pocket, you're not gonna like that very much. So again, try to find knockoffs that work. Um, I linked a link here that um, I use for the uh, Laffin La boards. They're pretty good. I do recommend that. All right. At this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and do the demo now. Demo's really going to go really quick. So um, for a show of hands here, how many of you guys have actually had experience with Arduino before in this room? Just raise your hand or tell me your experiences. David, Juby, Caesar, Addy. Very nice. So hopefully uh, I gave you some information you haven't learned yet, but uh, this Arduino lab is just gonna be very basic, like the most basic thing you can ever think of. Okay. Choose my virtual background. And I guess you can see my wonderful room. All right, so again, this is the Arduino Nano. This is a breadboard. You put it on. And this LED here, it's better if I show you guys a person, but of course I can't, so I'll do my best here. Um, when you put a part on, well, we're gonna start with just an LED for those who don't know what this is. Uh, I just have to go ahead and also expand my view. <laughs> Made that mistake last time. Okay, so this is an LED for those guys who uh, might not know what it is. And I have soldered a 330 ohm resistor to the end of it. And this is just to protect it from like overheating or over current or over voltage. Over current is more likely. Um, I've plugged it into the D2 pin of the Arduino because these are the GPIO pins. I apologize for the quality, it sucks. But one end goes into a digital pin and the other end goes to ground which is the, this pin right here. The pins are usually labeled onto the Arduino so you can know what they are. Um, on the Nano, it's like D2 to D9. I would warn you if you're using an ESP32, ESP um, if, you're, if you're putting it on the ESP32 and you're trying to code it into Arduino IDE, it's not gonna work because you need to say it as like D2, D3, those pins. Um, but on the Arduino Nano, you don't have to. And the reason is because the ESP32 does not have a um, set bootloader on Arduino. You have to use like Firebug or like Firefly or something like that. Um, it's an alternate one that also works for the ESP32, but then you have to name the pins differently. Just a warning for you guys who are going to delve into that. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. We're gonna do a bit of coding. Let's type it. All right, let me go ahead and share my, uh, uh, not yet, I don't wanna share it yet. I'm gonna open my Arduino IDE. If you guys don't have Arduino IDE and you're completely new to this, go ahead and go to slide two on the agenda um, and you can go to the speaker notes and you can see the link to download the Arduino IDE. Right now I'm gonna download this here. I recommend downloading from the website and not from Microsoft Windows Store. Um, and the reason is, if you download from Microsoft Store, it doesn't come with the drivers. So in case your board just like completely doesn't work, your knockoff board that you buy doesn't work, um, 
you can always just upload another driver to it based on the Arduino folder. But Microsoft doesn't have that. I have a blank test script up here, but I'm going to delete this and then rewrite it again so you guys can see what's going on. So when you first um, have your script open, this is what you're going to see. It's just going to be void setup and void loop. OK? Now, I like to teach this as there are three components to every single Arduino code, three. And if you want to add functions, good for you. But there's three main things you have to look out for. The first part is your variable instantiations. You, you declare any GPIO pins that you put in as like constant ints. And you can declare any libraries that you're going to use or declare any objects. So first is setup, not setup. First is variable declaration and library declaration. I want to make my board, my uh, little board right here. You can't see it yet because it's plugged into my computer. I want to make the green light on my board blink, uh, blink on for one second and then blink off for one second and then blink on for one second and then blink off for one second. Easiest example in the book, textbook Arduino. So what I'm going to do first is there are a few ways to do this. You can use defined, but I like using const int. Const int. Um, I'm going to say LED equals two. Now, a const int means that you can't change the value of this later on. And it's good because you don't want to, right? You want the LED to stay in pin two the entire time it's in the board. It's not going to just go um, out and play catch and then like move pins on the Arduino. It's going to stay constant. Now, Arduino is based on C++ and a little bit of C. So if some of the syntax looks familiar, uh, that's probably why. So a constant int will not change. And we're going to set that. LED constant to two because it's on pin two of the digital GPIO pins. Now that's pretty much it. We don't have any other connection. It's just a green light, right? So we can move on to setup. This is stage two of the Arduino setup. Here you want to instantiate your serial monitor. You want to use pin mode to declare if your pin is an output or input pin. Your Arduino needs to know if your pin is going to be output or input because it needs to know if it's going to send out signals or it's going to receive signals. There, there are two different things. If it's an output, which means it sends signals out, um, it's going to set the pin as turning from like digital logic zero to digital logic five, or sorry, digital logic zero to digital logic one, which has a five volt logic level. So when it has a digital logic of one, it's going to send five volts out the pin. But before we do that, let's do serial up again. Now, as I said before, the best way to test your code is by using print statements, right? In Arduino, that doesn't really exist. You have serial monitor instead, because um, that's how you're going to know what's going on in your Arduino. So I'm going to do serial up again, 9600, and I'm going to do pin mode. Now, my LED is a device that I want to send signals out from the Arduino. Therefore, I'm going to do pin mode LED output. Now, outputs can be LEDs, can be motor signals, can be outputs to a transistor for like a uh, voltage leveler. Um, inputs can be sensors, so like ultrasonic sensors, can be cam camera sensors. I don't know if that exists for Arduino, but it can be temperature sensors, right? It can be pressure sensors, um, LiDAR sensors, I don't know. But any type of sensor is an input. If it feeds data into the Arduino, it's called an input. And finally, I'm going to do digital write. So we just went over like three different functions here. But digital write will write a signal to the Arduino, either zero or one, because it's digital GPIO pin. Digital means that there's only like two options you can have, zero and one, on, on, or off. You know. So I'm going to write LED to low. Now you can use low, you can use high, you can use zero, you can use one. It means the same thing. I like using low and high because I can like see it going low and see it going high. High mean being it's on. So I'm digital writing LED to low. And I'm doing this because I don't want the LED to be on in the first place. Our setup function is kind of like our initial conditions. We want to set uh, our initial conditions to, um, to that the LED will be low when we start the code. OK, now we finished setting up our voice setup. I'm Actually, one more thing. I'm going to go ahead and do serial.println. 
This is how you display data in your serial monitor. This is your print statement in C. I'm going to print finished setting up code. If I see this in the serial monitor, it means that, oh, I know the, yeah, the Arduino has finished setting up its code. I can move on. If this doesn't print, then I know that something's going wrong in the setup uh, function. So after this is the third part, which is the loop. Now, like it says, a loop is like an infinite while loop, right? Uh, it's like while one equals one or while true. It's always going to continuously run, which makes Arduino a very synchronous module, right? A synchronous one function, one thread module. If anybody know multi uh, what multi-threading is, um, basically running multiple processes on a microcontroller at the same time, Arduino is not your not not your device for that. It can only run one process, uh, but it does it very well. It's trying its best. It's very small. It's trying its best. So our void loop, we're going to run a piece of code repeatedly. Now, if you want to stop the code at any point and run something else, that's called an interrupt. Uh, and an interrupt is asynchronous, but we'll talk about that later on. Or if you're taking like ECE 3301L, you probably already covered it, but I digress. So in here, what I want to do is I'm going to do serial.println. These are like comments. I'm going to say turn on the light. And then I'm going to go do digital write. I'm going to write the LED to high. And then I'm going to use the delay function. And the thing that goes in delay is in milliseconds. So 1,000 milliseconds, it would be one second. So I'm going to delay for one second. All right. And it's going to turn on the light for one second, and then it's going to turn off the light for another second, right? So I'm going to do serial.println, and then I'm going to say turn off the light. And then I'm going to do digital write and LED to low. And I'm going to set delay of 1,000. OK. We're done. So it's just going to continuously turn on the light and then turn off the light. It's going to print data to the serial monitor so we can see it. So let's go ahead and upload our code. When we upload code to the Arduino, we take a look at tools first. It says board is the Arduino Nano, so that's good. Our processor, which is our chip, is the AT Mega 328P. And our port is COM7. This port is really important because your computer knows to access the Arduino through this. So if everything is good, we're going to upload. And here's where I'm going to show the board itself. All right, so you can probably see that the green light is lining up and lighting off, which is what I said it would do. So I'm going to take a look inside the terminal monitor or serial monitor. And we can see that it says turn on the light, turn off the light, turn on the light, turn off the light, right? This data is coming from the Arduino itself. It's not coming from the computer. So the Arduino is sending data through its port through this USB port all the way to the computer, and the computer is reading from that. And these are our fail safe statements. If, we, if something fails in the code and we don't know what's going on, we can um, put a print statement there to make sure the code reaches it. And if it does, we're happy. So awesome. Now we can make a blink piece of code, and our light bulb will not blow up because we've connected in the right direction, and we attached the 330 ohm resistor to the end of it. I mean, I soldered it on, but you know, same deal. All right, I'm gonna unplug this. So it's time for our last um, section, our last segment, I guess. And I'm gonna demonstrate, uh, let me just, hold on. I'm gonna demonstrate one of the products that I've uh, worked on in the past year that I'm still using, uh, which is my Alexa sync. So good, and turn on. <laughs> my house has a broken sink which is inside my bathroom over there in through the door. And it's been broken for a while. I don't know, we haven't fixed it yet, but the sink doesn't output water. And that's my most convenient way to get water. 
I'm really lazy. I don't want to go out to get water from the outside sink. So uh, I'll show you what I mean. All right, so give me one second. I got to switch to my phone and then I'll take you on a tour um, of the device I made to help me wash my hands using Alexa. All right, on my phone here. Um, go ahead and pin that. Move pin. All right, just to make sure you guys can hear me, okay? All right, let me go ahead and disable my filters. Okay, so here's the deal. Close my echo. I have my sink here, right, which has been broken for like over a year now. Like I turned it on, the water water doesn't come out. Um, I built this elaborate system in which we have a pump here in this tub which pumps water out and into my hands. That's what this two beer is for. And this motor is connected through a wire all the way down here into like this little uh, breadboard here, but that actually just connects it to more wire, which connects it all the way to the setup I have out here. Now, this is an ESP32. I have this connected to the internet. It's been on for like over a year now. It's connected to 10.1 uh, volts. Um, and it's powering an L298 module, which is a PWM motor controller. Uh, now this thing is pretty much like, it's, it's, it's very uh, <laughs> inefficient solution because they could, could have just used a transistor, but it's really cool because um, this is usually used for a motor controller. I just like had it, so I just yanked it out and used it. Um, but I can turn a motor on and off using this device. And the wire from the bathroom feeds directly into this uh, into this motor controller in which its digital signals are fed directly into the ESP32. So I have some code in here that when I activate the Alexa sync, uh, it'll go ahead and turn on and turn on the motor, which turns on the pump and washes my hands. So to demonstrate, this is full of water. And I'll say, um, Alexa, turn on the sink. Water comes out. And this is just like basic digital logic. Um, I give it command, it changes a variable inside the script, and then Alexa turns on the sink. I'm gonna waste water here. And turn it off, I'll just say, Alexa, turn off the sink. Yeah, and the water stops coming out. It's a very cool, um, cool way to, I have to squeeze it. It's too full sometimes. It's a very neat way to, I guess solve my problem, although it's kind of an efficient way. But if I go back out here, we can say that the logic all happens uh, inside this little module. So it's one of the practical applications you can uh, do with an Arduino or some of its corresponding controller devices. Go ahead and switch back now. All right, y'all can, can still hear me, right? That was my uh, trial run. Uh, let's see here. Pin on the wrong person. Me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was my trial run of uh, trying to demonstrate something on a Zoom call. I don't know how it went. We'll have to see it during the recording. But um, yeah. So let's sync. 
uh, I really do encourage you guys to try to build projects yourself, solve your problems that's all right, that's like in your household, um, or make something with the Arduino that um, you can try to present because it, it's really cool. You can do stuff. It's like autonomous, right? When we write code, when we write software, we always say we want to do things autonomously. And then we can do that with uh, both software and hardware. So it's the best of both worlds. So yeah, thanks, David. Thanks, uh, thanks, Addy. Um, but as for now, uh, do you, did any of you guys have any questions for me about what we covered so far? If you upload code to an Arduino, disconnected from your computer, and then connected to a different power source, will it still run that code? Good question, Addy. Now, I already know the answer to this because I worked with you before, but let's say we don't know the answer to this. The best way to find out is to test your hypothesis. So I have my Arduino here. I disconnected it from my computer and I'm gonna get a power source right now and we'll try it out. Okay. So this is the power source we use for Hyperloop. It's a big power bank and we usually use it for power a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis require like an enormous amount of energy and this thing's pretty heavy. so. It does the job really well. Uh, I accidentally pulled the pin out. So I'm gonna connect the Arduino back to the D2 pin. And we still have our blink code, remember. So when I plug this into the um, to the power source, it should run blink. Let me see if I can hold this with one hand and plug it in with the other hand. Here we go. It does. So the Arduino, Arduino is like, chip here has been programmed in order to run your code, even if it's plugging to another device. So that means we don't have to keep uploading, re-uploading code to the Arduino every time we unplug it from the power, or that'll be really, really, um, really annoying for us to do. Okay. I think I unplugged it. Oh. Any other questions? For how long do you think Arduino can do this uh, saving the code? Forever. Uh, until you change the code or it gets crushed by a boulder. So <laughs> unless you completely destroy it, it'll remember. It's like formatting the inside of a... Um, I don't, I don't even know analogy. It's like it's building a new factory every time you upload a new piece of code. And the new factory inside of that chip, you can think of like little tiny electrons moving around. It's saying, okay, and you, and you turn the D2 pin on for one second and turn it off for one second. Turn it on for one second, then turn it off for one second. It's really cool. All right, let me just share the last slide so I can <laughs> get the recording done with. All right, that's the question slide, but <laughs> if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know now. You find the code, examples of code just for just about any sensor, right? That's correct. So I highly just suggest you guys to Google, use Google to your advantage. It's the 21st century, it's 2021. Google has like, has like, had my, had all my answers to sensors, documentation, whatever it was, because if something's open source, say you have like a accelerometer, right? You don't know how to use it. If you buy a knockoff, be careful because it might not have documentation. But if it's like from Adafruit or something like that, uh, it does have sample code. If you are if you have Arduino libraries, those libraries have sample code. You can use it to test your sensor and it has all the information you need in order to get that sensor to work. Now, an important thing about that is you need to make sure you have the right type of communication. So I2C, SPI, whatever it is. Um, but as long as you have formatted on the Arduino, um, you can use those libraries to help you get the sensor to work. Do you have a 3D printer and use it for any Arduino projects? Yes, I do. I have a um, 3D printer back there. Uh, I did use it for a Arduino project. I can show you guys <laughs> more stuff. 
I made a little game controller for my friend, which is why I wanted to show you guys for like the Leo, Arduino Leo used as a USB controller. Um, let's see here, I'll stop sharing. So it's kind of like a multidisciplinary job here. Okay, this is like the first picture I show you. Uh, looks like a mess, right? But this is like a game controller I made for uh, one of my friends. Uh, it has a lot of buttons and it's all connected to our Arduino Leo. But this is uh, all inside a box. Let me show you the outside version of it. It kind of looks like this. There are a few buttons here. Um, few twisty knobs. If you guys know what this game is, you probably, you probably can guess it, but I 3D printed the case for it because all the cases need specific um, sizes for the buttons. I have a dial caliper in which, um, dial calipers are really good for measuring holes. Uh, if you're 3D printing something, uh, I think Alex might have said that in like a previous workshop. Um, let me see. Uh, my friend's probably gonna like talk to me about this later, but like this gameplay of it. The buttons light up too, because they have individual LEDs inside them. So it's about that. And it's all running on the Leo, which is USB 2.0 support. Uh, so to answer your question, yes. <laughs> 3D printers are amazing because you can, uh, if you have the CAD skills, you can create anything out of them. All right. Do you have any beginner uh, 3D printers from Amazon? Uh, I would say if you're looking for 3D printers, go with the either the Ender 3 or JG Magic. Um, just make sure you keep it at in, in like a safe place at room temperature so you don't burn it out. I'll go ahead and send one to you, but. Uh, it's three, so I'm going to pass the, pass the torch to Aria in a little bit. But to those who are watching at home, um, off uh, for those who are, I found a little sleep, sleep deprived right now, I apologize. But for those who are watching at home, thank you for watching and um, hope you learned something today. Yeah, thank you for those of you who are online.